www.wokeup.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. WOKB, Winter Garden, Orlando. Welcome to another edition of Real Family Talk. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another week of Real Family Talk. This is your host, Jay Real. I hope everybody's having a great Tuesday night. Um, we're having a pretty good night in Orlando here. The weather is uh, crazy. It's Orlando. <laughs> Let's see, it was 80 degrees yesterday. Uh, then today it rained, and I think now we're down in the low 60s or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's how we do it here in Orlando. We just we just switch it up and with the weather all the time. All the time. All the time. I think it's even going to be cool tomorrow, I believe. 80 degrees, 60 degrees, and then 60 degrees again. 20 degrees in, in one day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> gotta love it, man. You gotta love Gotta love that Orlando weather, man. Gotta love that Orlando weather. How's everybody doing tonight? We got uh, Jeremy's in the building. How you doing, Jeremy? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How's everybody doing? Doing all right, brother. We got Miss Monica's in the building. How you doing, Miss Monica? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. You know it's Tuesday, Tuesday. Miss Monica. You know that is the best <laughs> evening of the week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then we got uh, Miss McCray's in the building. How you doing, Miss McCray? What's up? What's up, Miss McCray? Oh, tonight, man, we have a uh, special guest that's going to be joining us tonight. Mr. Ty Gray L is the name. Mr. Ty Gray L. He is a uh, internationally renowned poet, playwright, author, and spoken word artist. So he's going to be joining us uh, in a few minutes, Mr. Ty Gray L. We look forward to talking uh, to Mr. Ty Gray L. Been reading up on uh, re- reading up about this gentleman. And uh, checking out his website, checking out some of the uh, poems that he's written uh, or short stories as well that he's written. And uh, definitely, definitely sounds like an interesting brother. So can't wait for uh, this particular conversation this evening. Uh, but first, just just to kind of lighten it up, because Mr. Tigre, I believe, is going to be pretty deep on me tonight. Uh, <laughs> but just to keep it, lighten it up just a little bit before he comes on. Uh, sports, baby. Mm. It's March 12th. It's the start of free agency. And already, already I should say, Steeler Nation is down one. <laughs> Can you believe that? We're down one. The free agency just began only a few hours ago, five hours ago to be exact. <laughs> and Steeler Nation is already down one. Mr. Mike Wallace, the uh, deep threat receiver that we have, is now going to be a Miami Dolphin. Oh, man. Now going to be a Miami Dolphin. So we'll, we'll see what the Steelers do. It was inevitable. The man was commanding twelve, thirteen million dollars a year, and uh, you don't get paid like that in uh, in Pittsburgh unless your name is Roethlisberger. <laughs> mm-hmm. You don't get paid like that in Pittsburgh as, as a wide receiving core. They didn't, they're not going to pay that kind of money. So it was inevitable. He certainly wasn't going to get that kind of deal out of Pittsburgh. Uh, but uh, usually, the one thing I love about about our Steelers is there's always a guy in the wings that's waiting to step up and uh, and take control of the man that left. So uh, we'll see what we got out there um, and see what happens next season. Or maybe we, maybe they'll surprise me and uh, pick up a, a nice little receiver in the free agency market. But uh, there's not a lot out there, but we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens, man. Another, uh, another thing happening in sports, Tiger Woods, y'all. Tiger Woods has won two events this year, y'all. Two events. First time in five years he's won two events in the same year. So the question they say, is he back? Is, is Tiger Woods back? Yeah, he got another blonde girlfriend now, <laughs> so he's getting that that extra boost. He's got, he's got another blonde girlfriend. He's is getting that, what that it loving. Takes? It, well, we don't know how yeah. many other girlfriends he may have. Well, this is true. He, right now, he has a what? Lindsey Vaughn. He might have the underground stable back. <laughs> he has an, another athlete, so she understands his his lifestyle. Lindsey Vaughn. You know that's what it was saying. It was like he back. He he went in. He got his white girl, so he good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why he got he back in the swing of things now. That's so good. That's what they was, that's what they are saying. I don't know. That's what they saying. I, I don't know either, brother. I'm just uh, I am glad to see him on the uh, winning side again. That that's that is good to see, man. I just like to see brother succeed. He did have a he's had a rough past five years, 
and uh, glad to see him. You know, he's not back on top or anything. They're they're uh, they're waiting to see what he does in the Masters. That's gonna be that's gonna be their key. Is he gonna win in the Masters? <laughs> yeah, that's what they're waiting to see how he does in a couple of weeks at the Masters, and then. And then if he, you know, if he wins, they're gonna pretty much crown him again. He's back. He's, right. he's back. He's back to where he was five years ago. Blah 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 blah. But uh, man, just shout out to Tiger Woods for doing uh, two events in 2013. Man, that's a, certainly a whole lot better than it was last year. So, shout out to Tiger Woods, man. The other uh, last thing I'll mention here before uh, we bring on our guest gets up here. Um, Dwight Howard's back in town, y'all. Mm, playing right now. Uh-huh. Playing right now, y'all. The uh, I was laughing all week because Sports Talk Radio has basically been been uh, talking about all week how what was the name that they were going to be yelling in the in the stadium tonight <laughs> 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 as he was playing. Uh-huh. They had they had uh, a few of them been doing it all week long, just taking hashtags, Twitter remarks phone call-ins as far as what they were going to say they had uh, they were throwing out diva was diva. a was a pretty good one <laughs> dwight they, coward dwight coward oh. was people, people had magic jerseys <laughs> i was watching the news before we got here in the back of their jersey they wore the regular dwight howard but put a c oh. by the howard <laughs> dwight coward <laughs> dwight Cow- like, oh man <laughs> that's Poor rough fella. right now the score is 84 to 68 though i mean 84 to 68. Fourth quarter, nine minutes left. And uh, I take it the Lakers are winning? Yes. Well, you know. Poor magic. It is magic. <laughs> I'm magic. What is the record, like 17 and 44 or something like that? Yeah. Oh, I, well, I didn't know they wore that many games. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it is this season, man. But, uh, hey, they, they, got, they got a win on them earlier this year, right? So one for one is not bad. One for one is not bad. But it would have been nice to see the magic win. Um, at home, but uh, at you know, home. it is what it is. Uh, we know the uh, the team is down. Um, a few of the players, are, you know, Big Baby Davis, he's out. Um, he's a big time player for the team this year. He's not playing, and uh, Chris Turkey Lou is suspended, and uh, a couple other guys on the on the uh, on the unactive list as well. So you know, we, we're doing the best we can, man. We're doing the they best. They got we rid can. of JJ Reddick. They did get rid of JJ. You Reddick, know, man. Mr. King isn't here tonight, but I'm sh- positive he's gonna say, "Watch JJ Reddick's gonna blow up, <laughs> blow up." Like, I mean, he's gonna be an All Star player he's, after he left the Magic. Well, he well, the one thing about Reddick, he's a system player. So if he go go to a, a, a team that got good scores around him where they go draw double teams and he can just shoot up the jumpers, then, yeah, he'll be in better position. He's going to kill him. You know, I mean, but him, they relying on him to be a, the second option here. You know, that that's not his game. Well, I think he's going to do well. He went to Milwaukee, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. right? Yep. I think he's going to do well in Milwaukee. They're yeah, uh, they're in the playoff spot right right now. I don't, right, I don't think anybody's doing well in Milwaukee. <laughs> no, <laughs> they're in the playoff spot right now, aren't mm. they? I don't know, but if they are, it's about default. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> let's just be honest. I think they are in the playoff spot. I think they are a playoff team, Milwaukee. So we'll see what happens, man. Everybody's a playoff team in the Heat. <laughs> I mean, in the East. I should in say. the East, everybody's a playoff team. Yeah, everybody everybody's in contention until like the last the last two weeks in, in the Magic. That's it. <laughs> Poor magic. Hey man, it's it's that year. It's that year. We're gonna yeah, be. It's a rebuilding process. It's a rebuilding I mean, that's process. A part, that's part of it. It takes a couple of years, and uh, and we'll get there. We'll be back. We'll be back in the hunt, especially in the East. Like you said, the East is uh, it's pretty weak on uh, overall talent, or let's say the talent that that is in the East beats up on each other. So if you can get around fifty fifty, you usually can get in sneak in sometimes in the playoffs in the East. So. So uh, a couple of years, and I think we'll be right back in the thick of things, at least in the eighth spot. Maybe two more years after that, we'll be back down to our uh, three or four spot that we were uh, when we had Dwight Howard here. Mm-hmm. But uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Uh, shout out to the Orlando Magic, man. Oh, Magic. Hey, Magic. Wait, what about that dunk? You know, I heard about the dunk. You talking you about the dunk it? that DeAndre Jordan did the other night? Yes, over Brandon Knight. Poor Brandon Knight. I didn't see the <laughs> dunk, but I heard it's like one of the greatest dunks ever in a game. That's what they keep hyping it up at. It's cr- it's crazy. I, I'll have to make sure I go and watch it and uh, see what it's about. 
Uh, but uh, but yeah, yeah, I didn't I didn't get a chance to see to see that dunk. Man, we'll see what happens. Uh, so uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll move on for the evening. And uh, I see our guest is on the line. How you doing there, Mr. Ty Grayell? I'm good. I'm good. Am, am I speaking to Jay Real? This is Jay Real. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Well, you you were talking about me getting serious. Um, uh, and just before I get serious, I just want to say. Uh, with respect to your Steelers, uh, <laughs> go Ravens. Oh, go yes. Ravens. <laughs> See? I'm a, I'm a diehard Ravens fan, man. I got Ravens paraphernalia everywhere, so, you know, it's my year. So. <laughs> At least for the moment. Y'all just got rid of your yeah. best receiver, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah, well, you know, I love to hate you guys, so, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of those things. So, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I feel happy this evening to, to be able to throw a little, little something in your face. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But I'm, but I'm upset too because they traded away Anquan Bolden. Yeah, I can't, yeah they I did. Can't even understand why they. So, but anyway, that, that was that was my sports trivia. Uh-huh. And you got to see that dunk though. You got. Yes. I don't even know how you missed it, man. It's been on every. They 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 even showed the dunk on on um on serious talk show. That's how bad. That's how this. I've never seen anything like this. When you do see it. It's gonna, you're gonna go. Oh my God! <laughs> it was that good. Huh? Yeah, that was tweet, they, they said it has been is the most tweeted sports fact or, or or sports moment in the history of Twitter. Yeah. Oh wow! It, it was nasty. It was nasty. <laughs> it was nasty. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a shout out to Brandon Knight. He's, Brandon he's a Florida Knight. boy. Bless us. You oh, know he's yeah, a poor Brandon. He's a Florida he's boy. Yeah, can't get yeah. on too bad. You know he's. He, was, he just got caught out of position. You know, he made a mistake. The guy's well, st- seven feet well, tall. He took it well. <laughs> and and he, the, way, the way he responded to it was, was, was really, you know, I, I applaud him for, you know, for, for, you know, not taking it too seriously, you know? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I appreciate that. But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens this year, sir. We got a few months, but we'll see what happens <laughs> in that football season. But, uh, yes, uh, thank you for uh, coming on, sir. We really appreciate it. We want to, um, I want to let you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. And then what I want to do is I, um, I pulled up uh, A Black Woman Smile. I know uh, that's a, a poem you did that really blew up a few years ago. But I want to, um, I pulled up a clip off of YouTube. So I want you to introduce yourself, and then I want to play that, and then, uh, and then we'll talk about that, and then move into some other things real quick. So go ahead and introduce yourself, sir. Okay, well, um, my name is Ty Gray L, and I was uh, born and raised uh, in the first black public assisted housing project in these United States of America, which happens to be in Washington, D.C., the place called Langston Terrace. And uh, uh, growing up there as a native Washingtonian, you know, I, I, watched, I watched my neighborhood deteriorate from what they called a, a project into like a reject and so my it, it led me into a a, a life of a, a, well i would say nefarious because I, I just ended up going all the wrong ways early in my life and um, but because my mother and grandmother raised me and put all these values in me you know they came back a little bit later and it caused me to be extremely afrocentric and to think about uh, all of the things that are causing our people today to act the way they're acting. And when I say that, I mean the, the, the negative aspects of what we're doing, you know, not knowing who we are, not knowing where we came from, being ashamed of uh, of who we are. You know, you've mentioned Tiger Woods, and, you know, he refused. He don't even call himself black. He calls himself Cavalasian. Right. And, and as, and, and as I, don't, I don't know if that was Phyllis or whoever it was that just said something about, you know, his next blonde, uh, is, is, you know, our people just seem to run away from who they are. And so who I am is, they call me the minister of poetry, uh, and my whole focus is on trying to wake our people up. Um, I don't know where you are religiously, but myself, I'm a, call myself a, a Christian man, and I believe that the biggest problem facing black people uh, in particular, and the world at large, is that we're not honoring the fifth commandment of Moses, which simply states that you must honor your father and your mother, that your days may be longer upon the earth, which the Lord thy God has given thee. And I think that that is the, the, 
destruction of our, of our families. That is the reason why black people are living the shortest lives of any other people on the planet. Is because we are just not, we're disconnected from who we are. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's, a, that's, that's a short version, man. It's a whole lot more to the, you know, to, to it. But that's okay. kind of a short version. All right, well, uh, and, uh, and we'll, we'll maybe get into a couple of those things tonight. So real quick, like I said, I want to, uh, I want to play that black woman smile. Um, and then uh, after we play it, I want you to talk about it a little bit. Uh, you ready over there, Jeremy? Yeah. Go right here, sir. I guess we're, we're coming in a few moments, sir. Is that what's happening right there? Yes, it's, it's loading. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Ty, it's Phyllis. Hi. Okay, hi, Phyllis. Hey. Uh, wh- while we're waiting for the piece to load, um, going over your bio and looking over the site, Jay Real and I both love your education. <laughs> uh, and it says, Ty earned a BS in streetology from the District of Columbia, a master's degree in survival from the ghettos of North America, and a PhD in psychology from the University of Hard Knocks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and, th- and then th- I'm just as proud of, of my academic uh, achievements as anybody who has graduated from Harvard, yes. Howard, or Yale. Yes. <laughs> and and I, I mean that because I, you know, I came up... Uh, you know, I had to get it the hard way, and and um, it has been. You know, I've, I've, I had to re-educate myself because they told me when I was a, a, a young boy, when I was 12 years old, that I was actually ineducable. Um, and we, I mentioned, you know, the streets and everything, but by the time I turned 12 years old, I just was completely disillusioned with everything that had to do with education in the schools. I, I was like, I don't want to hear. They keep telling me about George Washington. Thomas Jefferson, I can't see myself in none of that. And I just, I, you know, I just, I, I actually acted up in school so much that they put me in social adjustment classes. Mm. And then eventually, uh, you know, told me that I was ineligible. So my, I really actually, I, I never completed the eighth grade. Um, you know, of course, later on I went back, got GED, and went to college and, and all mm. that stuff much later. But... In my early academic years, I never went to school. I never, uh, you know, I taught myself. And so when I talk about those those street-level degrees, I'm serious. I mean, it sounds like I'm in jest. I mean, I am say it lightly, but I mean every word of that because that's how I learned. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And, 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 I, and there's one thing, I think, too, to take away from that. You know, there, there's one thing to be, you know, book-educated. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times it's just as important to be, quote unquote, street educated as well. Um, and, and sort of that hand in hand thing can can take you a long way because there's a lot of lessons learned uh, that can be learned in the streets that really can apply uh, to everyday life. Uh, so, you know, there's, like you said, there's nothing nothing to be ashamed of about that as well. So, well, you know, as a poet, and if, if I may, I, I'd like to share something with you guys. Um, I am. Um, like I said, I was born and raised in a place called Langston Terrace, and a lot of people think it was named for Langston Hughes, the poet, but it actually wasn't. It was a guy by the name of John Mercer Langston, who happened to be the first um, president of Howard University's law school. The place was built way back in 1938, so we're talking way back then. But coming up in Langston Terrace, you know, I got a profound respect for Langston Hughes, because most of us thought it was named for Langston Hughes. So, I don't know if you, any of you seen the the, uh, the movie Raisin in the Sun? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, a um, couple of renditions. Uh, Sidney Poitier did it years and years ago. Um, T. Diddy did it recently, mm-hmm. played the, the lead character in it. But there's a line in it that came from a poem by Langston Hughes, and the poem's called Harlem, and in the poem he asked, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Or maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it just explode? What happens to a dream deferred? 
And I share that with you because later I wrote a poem called Deferred Dreams, which speaks to the neighborhood that I came from, which actually speaks to my education and speaks to my whole circumstance. It's a short poem called um, Deferred Dreams. I dreamed of a home where the grass was green. My neighbors were happy and pleasant. But I woke to streets of asphalt so mean only fear and despair were present. My dream was deferred. I dreamed the schools taught children to think, and the system encouraged our youth. Upon awakening, curriculums didn't have the missing link, and some books taught lies, not truth. Still another deferred dream. I dreamed that crack never entered my hood, and the eyes of my people were clear. But I woke to merchants up to no good selling $5 rocks right here. Still another deferred dream. I dream King Heroin lost his throne and my folk regained their pride. But I woke in the projects hooked on bone and my pride was set aside. Still another deferred dream. I dream that murder was a thing of the past and weapons had disappeared. But I woke to a generation dying fast, gunshots loud and clear. Still another deferred dream. Finally, I dreamt it was all a plot, and my deferment was contrived. But when I woke, the reward I got was the knowledge I had survived in spite of my deferred dream. Mm. So I shared that because that is that's really a part of my testimony. As a matter of fact, every piece of poetry that I do is a part of my testimony, including the black woman's smile. So. Well, and uh, you said we can, we had that up, Germ, Jeremy, or no? Yeah, let's try it. Let's try it again. Let's see if it comes up. Think that is a no? <laughs> guess not. No, nah, it's not good. Cool. I guess it's not playing out. Well, do me a favor, uh, Tigreo. Uh, tell me, uh, go ahead and talk about a black woman's smile. I've I seen the video, and um, I thought it was interesting. You said the uh, the inspiration of, of where you come up with this particular p particular poem. Well, I was, um, and I, I can share the piece with you if, you if you like, if you're not able to pull it up. And But, but the, the reason why I wrote it is, I was riding into downtown D.C. I live right on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. And I was uh, coming in, going into downtown D.C. at a, at a three-lane traffic light. And I pull up in the far left lane. This very attractive sister pulls up in the middle lane. This brother, he pulls up on the right and blows his horn. And with horn, you know, I looked at the same time the sister and looked at him like with this look of complete disdain and disgust on her face like like she like she just swallowed something nasty and it dawned on me how disrespectful it was for him to blow his horn because my mother and grandmother raised me told me two things you don't do as a chivalrous young man you don't blow your horn at a woman you don't whistle at a woman so that was the first thing that dawned on me but she, she did this thing with her neck that um, <laughs> I, I've never seen other ethnic groups of women do. I've only, only seen black women do that. <laughs> you know how to snap a neck real neck, quick. Like but. when they're disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know how they make, they, Jay, Jay, you know how they make their necks kind of swivel like? Yes, like, yes. And so, and so it, you know, I kind of chuckled at that a little bit. But then driving into downtown D.C. that day, I had some business downtown. And I've noticed that Asian women, Latino women, white women, they just didn't smile as, I mean, I mean, black women just didn't smile as often as those other ethnic, I mean, I, you know, I was, pay, I really was paying attention. They, you know, I was looking in the restaurants, walking down the street, and black women were generally not smiling. And they, and the other ethnic groups of women were. And it just, you know, it really resonated with me that day. It just hit me hard that day. So I went back home that night, and I woke up the next morning, with the poem called A Black Woman Smile. Would you like for me to share it? Go right ahead, sir. Okay. Do you know how strong you have to be to make a black woman smile? Do you have any idea what an accomplishment that is? Because she is born... Because she is...
she is born on her week. Hold on a second. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My phone just did something really crazy. Let me let me let me start over. Do you know how strong you have to be to make a black woman smile? Do you have any idea what an accomplishment that is? She has borne the weight of this country on her back for 400 years. She's been carrying the load of America in her belly since its infancy. She has suffered the agony of unassisted husband of child rearing since the 1600s. Have you any idea how much strength it takes to put a smile on her face? You need the strength of Samson, the nerve of Joshua, and the courage of David facing Goliath. Because she has cultivated in her womb the marvel of the universe, only to have her hopes and dreams aborted and her aspirations show up dead on arrival. She's given birth to kings and queens and delivered on her majestic promise, only to have her children kidnapped and sold to a criminal with no respect for her royalty. If you can make a black woman smile, you are a miracle worker. Imagine breastfeeding your child in Virginia and having him snatched from your arms, branded, hijacked to Louisiana, and publicly fondled on a Orleans auction block. If the memory of that pain was locked bound in your DNA, would you be smiling? If you breastfed someone else's child only to watch her grow old enough to call you darky, pickaninny, and nappy-headed jigaboo, you wouldn't be smiling either. If you can make a black woman smile, you have done something. If you can make her smile, you are stronger than Atlas, because God knows she has been. She's been raped, ravaged, and scorned, and nearly annihilated. She's been pimped, pummeled, and stoned, and deliberately depreciated. She has cooked and cleaned and sewn and never been comfortable. She's been forced to watch the offspring of her loins mangled and maligned across the city. Her character has been continuously smeared, assassinated over and over and over, again and again and again. You ever thought about how strong you have to be to be a black woman? She's had to make brick without straw after being stripped of all her customs, all her culture, and all her traditions. No other woman in the history of the civilized world has gone through what she's gone through. No other being on this planet has endured what she has endured. She's been chastised, criticized, demonized, and terrorized. She's had to stand when her man was bullwhipped for trying to stand. She's had to stand when her man was castrated for trying to stand. She's had to stand when her man was hung by his neck for trying to stand. She's had to carry her man, because every time he tried to carry himself, he was murdered for trying to do so. Ask Betty Shabazz about Malcolm. Ask Coretta Scott King about Martin. Ask Emmett Till's mother. Ask Medgar Evers' wife. You can make a black woman smile. You have achieved something. Since 1619, when we came in chains, the entire world's been messing with her brain, disrespecting her, calling her out of her name. And she's tired, just plain Fannie Lou Hamer, tired, tired of being called B-words and H-words and N-words and other words and everything except the child of God that she is. But there is one thing in this world that will make a black woman smile, and that's her man, a real man. If you're doing what you're supposed to do, she'll smile. She'll smile regularly and gladly. So man up, my brother. Man up. Make your woman smile. Treat her like the queen that she is. She deserves it. She deserves it. And recognize this. In all of God's creation, there is nothing more alluring, more appealing, or attractive. There's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing more charming, more charismatic, or captivating. Nothing more delightful. There's nothing more elegant or exquisite. There's nothing more fascinating, nothing more gorgeous. There's nothing more inspiring, more intoxicating or invigorating. There is nothing more magnificent, nothing more lovely than a black woman's smile. Mm, that's deep, brother. Oh, 
I love that, uh, I love that poem when, uh, when I got introduced to it when I was reading up on you. That, that is uh, definitely something that uh, I think should go down um, in history, you know, as, a, as one, of the, one of the great poems. But uh, I appreciate that. Um, you remember, you can give us a call here at the uh, station, and if you, have any, if you want to talk to Mr. Ty Grayell tonight, 407-894-1680 is the number. 407-894-1680 is the number. Now, um, you know, Ty, you were you were mentioning um, about your mission. Um, what what do you think about the state of Black America today? What what's your opinion on that, sir? Well, I, I think for the most part that we're we're sleeping giants. That we're 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 the most of us, the majority of us are really asleep because we are not connected with who we are. But I do see hope. I see. Uh, you know, like visiting college campuses and, and being in the academic world a lot. It's ironic because I never was in school early in my life, and now I seem to be on college campuses and then on, you know, dealing with education a great deal. But I, I, see, I see hope when our people start to wake up and recognize who they are. The state of black America, in my opinion, is, is like on hold for what it actually could be once we recognize the fact that we built all of this. It was, see, we've been so miseducated, Jay Real, that we don't even have a clue about our power. We don't even understand what we can do. But we are the ones who actually built this. All of this stuff was built, not just, not just on our brawn and our muscle, but it was our ingenuity and our thinking capacity. It was black people that taught the Army Corps of Engineers. It was, it, was, it, was black, it was black people that not only built the, the nation's capital, but we were the ones who, who did the mechanical uh, uh, drawings and, and, and laid out its, it, this whole country, man, just about everything. Have you ever heard of a guy by the name of Granville T. Woods? Granville T. Woods. The name sounds familiar, but I couldn't tell you who it was. Yeah, right well, now. you know, it's, one of the things is, and, and, and it's really, it's, it's not said that you don't know specifically, but none of us know. We don't, be, because that kind of information has been hidden from us. Granville T. Woods holds over 50 patents associated with the train. Mm. Every, almost everything associated with perfecting the subway and the train system that we have today is directly attributable to Granville T. Woods. Louis Latimer helped out with that. People, people give Thomas Edison, George, uh, George Westinghouse, Alexander Graham Bell, um, uh, these, these uh, big, uh, I was, I, I'm, the other guy's name is kind of slipping my mind right now, but we, because these people had a lot of uh, monetary resources, they get the credit for what we actually invented. Mm -hmm. Because when, if, you, if you look behind, you can do a little bit of research, a little bit of history on this. You'll find that it, it wasn't uh, Thomas Edison that invented the electric light. It was, it was Louis Latimer. Thomas Edison didn't even have an idea. It was Louis Latimer who brought it to him. Now, you can do a bunch of research, and you, you'll find out that Louis Latimer and Granville T. Woods both took Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell to court over their patents because mm. they stole them from them. So when you ask about the state of black America, back to your original question, I think that we just got to wake up, understand who we are, the power of, of who we are, what we have. And we got to, one of the things that we have to do is we have to embrace the part of our history that we are most ashamed of at this time. And that's a hard pill to swallow because nobody wants to look at chattel slavery because it was such a negative period in our time. But I'll tell you this, brother, if you visit that, it will, it will renew your spirit because you will find out just how strong you have been because no other people in the history of the civilized world has had to go. Every, almost every nation has suffered some form of slavery, but not one people except us have gone through chattel slavery, where we were stripped of all our customs, customs, um, traditions, and our culture. And so we, you know, we, we've been trying to
trying to assimilate everybody else's culture while everybody else tries to be like us. Right. So it's, it's just, it's so much to that, that question. I mean, I could just ramble and keep going. Cause well, I, well, well, I'll get you focused. Let me ask you, know you this. I mean? it's like, man, <laughs> we, really, we really just got to learn who we are because we've been miseducated. We've been taught, the, okay, we've been taught that everything associated with black is negative. Black cake, devil food, white cake, angel food. Worst day of, worst Monday of any uh, Monday in the history of Mondays was a Black Monday. Yep. Um, um, the good guys all wear white hats. You know, the, the right. worst it, September in the history of September was a Black September. Right, you're, so, you're right. It's, everything is very subliminal. Um, where, where, like you say, everything good is white, everything bad is black. And so ultimately, you're not saying it, but that's what you're thinking, that bad is black. I mean, yeah, black is bad and everything black is not good and and you see that perpetuated um, consistently, you know, just watching the news, you see that can, you know, perpetuated. Um, and so I, I definitely agree with you on that. Let's, in, in, in that same vein, though, I have another question for you. Um, you know, one of the things that, that people are most proud of today, of course, is uh, the election of President Barack Obama. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you put that in perspective? Well, man, let me tell you something. I cried because I never thought I would ever see the day you know, that we'd have a black president. Up, up until his inauguration, January 20th, 2009, I didn't believe it. Even even to the day of the inauguration, I was fearful that something was going to happen because that has been the history of, of this country. We not uh, promoted the our kind. So I, I would, so I, I'm, that's one of the reasons why I feel, I feel pretty good about America today, even though when you look on most of the south side of your major cities, the south side or the east side usually of your major cities, you'll find that we're not doing well at all. But I still have hope because of uh, President Obama. He's had his jump higher than any other. He's had it in any other president, history of president. Um, like, I don't care what your politics are and how you feel about him today. If you are a black person in America, um, that first inauguration, you had to feel a little bit of pride. Matter of fact, I wrote a short poem about it uh, called Obama's Inaugural Morning. Can I do that right quick? No, I, I have another piece that I want you to do because um, I okay. know you're a storyteller as well. So I want to save some time for that. So let's okay. not do that piece. But tell okay. us where to find it. How about that? Is it, is it online somewhere? Uh, no, it's not even in the book. Okay. Uh, And, ah, okay. Uh, so that particular piece is not on the Obama's inaugural more, but it'll be. We'll, I'm going to be doing. Uh, this is what I would suggest. I don't know how you how you how you do with respect to advertising, but I want to just do a shameless plug. I can be found on Facebook at Ty Gray L, and of course my website is tygrayl.com, and um, also I'm on Twitter uh, at uh, uh, Ty at Ty Gray L. Com. And I'm saying that because my book is actually on, uh, you know, you can get a hard copy, but I also have it on Kindle, or you, know, you can get it on your phone because you know all you do is download the Kindle app, and so it's the ebook as well. Um, so yeah, um, my thoughts about pr- President Obama is I'm hopeful, and um, I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping he makes a, he does a, a straight black gangster move before he gets out of office. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because he's been sort of docile and passive, according to some. Although he really hasn't. I mean, the man is an intellectual genius. You got to give that to him, and he has been extremely functional in that position as the first, as the first real recognized black president. So I'm, I'm not mad with him at all. I love him. I love the man. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that God has allowed for, for, for me to see it in my lifetime. And it really gives me hope. Hmm. All right, that's uh, that's that's good. I, we'll we'll disagree on the politi- political end of it, but uh, but I certainly yeah, well, yeah. I well, certainly I say, agree. I don't like a lot of things he's done. I certainly agree with you as far as its impact um, and what it means to Black America um, to to be able to to be able to see, you know, because you like you say that was that one thing. Uh, no matter who you were, until he actually uh, was inaugurated, you know what I mean. You you didn't believe you would ever see the day. 
that a black man would be president, you know, certainly not in my lifetime. I, I never expected that to happen. And so just to see him up there, uh, whether I agree with his politics or not, is a special moment um, and uh, certainly something that uh, will go down, especially for black folks that live to, to kind of see that day as uh, probably one of the greatest days that, uh, that they've seen in terms of a historical perspective um, yeah. in, in their life. So I, I agree with that. We, we're definitely going to disagree on all that politics. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, you know, one of the other things you are is, is an author. Um, and uh, you, you sent a, a piece to me today. And, and the reason why I didn't want you to do the poem because I want you to do this piece. And um, it is kind of, it's kind of long, but I want you to do it anyway. Um, you guys sent to me E.B. Detweiler and The Hanging Stage. Um, you know what I'm talking oh, about, right? Oh, oh, I know. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, I, I know where that comes from. That's, yeah. I, I, that was a um, okay. Yeah, that was sent in, but I didn't send that in. That was a request from someone else. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, okay. yes. It was, but nonetheless, um, I, I did get a chance to read it, and uh, and I wanted you to to do it on air tonight. I thought it was uh, again, you know, uh, thought provoking, as as a lot of your pieces are. Um, okay. And so, uh, if if you had you had that in front of you, oh yeah. yeah All right, why don't you do that for me, and okay. uh, and then we'll talk about you know wh where it comes from and stuff. Well, this is a, this is um, just as a, as a storyteller. First, just let me say this before I do it: is that we we there's an ancient African proverb that says, "Until the lion is able to tell his story, the hunter will always get the glory." And I think that's profound and significant. We got to start telling our own stories from our own perspective, and not let the hunter tell the story. Because you know we get the hunter's point of view, mm -hmm. and this is one of the, one of, of millions of stories that never get told. E. B. Detweiler in the Hanging Stage, age 80 years old, out of Walton, Tennessee, on the hottest day in July. Here our Lord, 1860, found myself to be riding the backside of a mule wagon with nine more slaves. We was tethered to boat holes with irons around our hands on the way to be sold at auction way down in Mobile, Alabama. At least that's what was told to us. It's so hot that the paddy rollers, what was bringing us, sink dead away at the top of a rise on our second day's travel. We was three days out of walking when we come upon a big city named Knoxville. And it appeared that everybody was full of joy and happy jollifulness. Some men was running around shouting. Others seemed to be gathering for some sort of shindig or not. The air was heavy and was thick and tasted like sulfur was in it. Now up till that day, I thought I had seen the worst there was to see in this life on earth. I expected there might be more worse in hell. But I thought for sight, there wasn't no more fight for sight than watching a man get his back tore open with a bullwhip. I thought the worst there was to see was the misery in the eye of a mother, seeing her son yanked away from her side to be soaked down river, never to be seen again. I thought the worst there was to see was your flesh blood sister dropped dead in a cornfield from tiredness. I thought the worst there was was to see the light go out of her eyes right next to you. Whilst the overseer crack his whip and tell you to keep moving. I thought that was the worst, but I had not traveled to Knoxville. These white men and some women running around all full of gladness and drunken cheer. And I know it wasn't Christmas because it's too hot, but Christmas and Thanksgiving was the only time I ever see so many white folk that happy and that drunk. It was pretty near a thousand or more million about coming up to this year makeshift platform. And as we riding in, they all start looking to us in the wagon. Some smiling, some frowning, all eyes fixed on the wagon we riding in. As we get closer to the makeshift platform, I see that some of the folk had blankets, baskets sitting on the ground. They had vittles and liquor to drink. And some of them had little stool-like chairs to sit on. It's like they coming to see one of them their stage shows or something. When we get to the platform itself, they taking us off the wagon and march us to the back of it. A hush fell over the crowd. A white man with the bluest, meanest set of eyes I ever seen on a human. He come to us and he say, boy, y'all know what y'all are here for? We all just sort of look to each other with questions in our eyes and a fear to look back in his. We keep our eyes lowered. And I said, no, sir, we don't. And he smiled, may 
have the evilest smile I ever seen on a man, matching his eyes. He walked away. And this year, other big, tall, red-haired fella with pockmarks all over his face, he say, y'all mean to tell us you ain't never been to a lynch party of folks? He laughed real loud and say, why, y'all's fitting to have the time of your life. Now, I told you I thought I had seen the West. Well, I had not. Next thing would happen was this little teeny white man couldn't have been no taller than a tree stump. He come up to us with these little burlap sacks about big enough to cover a lamp liner. He put them sacks over all ten of us heads. That man had a smell riding up off him like the perdition itself. They marched us blind round to the front of the hanging stage. Somebody shout, if we can't see their faces, it ain't going to be no fun. So the little stinky man come back, taking the boy lap off in our head. And it was no question that I was peering into the eyes of the devil and all his minions. It was like there was no life in that man's eyes, and no life in the eyes of that crowd neither. I ain't never been more afraid of nothing in my life. That's the first time I ever talked to God. I got acquainted with him on that hanging stage. I never was a praying man much before that minute. But that minute... I met my maker. <laughs> my spirit left my body and went somewhere else. I mean it. The blue-eyed one, he come back and commenced to shout and something I couldn't understand. Back then, I ain't here straight since that little smelly one took that bag off my head. But then they marched the first one of us up to the platform. And let me tell you this. There ain't no worse sight to see in this here life than to see a man's neck snap from a rope. There ain't no worse a sound like that neck bone cracking. There ain't no other worse a smell like the one would come when that man's innards break free from his hind parts as the result of it. It ain't no worse a sight to see than a man's neck stretched to a foot long and his tongue dangle from his mouth like a lap dog whilst the pee run down his leg. Now the only reason I'm here to tell this story is cause after they done hung the fifth of us the Lord himself put a halt to it. A twister come up over the same ride we rid in on it. Tore that whole picnic hanging party to peace. The wind and rain come like Noah in the destruction. We all tossed every witch away like the earth was mad. And when the storm stopped, there's nothing left of the crowd or the hanging stage. They happen a day or two later. I ain't right, rightly certain. But a blacksmith found me wandering around in my leg irons and my shackles. Put some mercy to me. Took off my burden. And I went to work for him. And for the next 50 years or more, I tended iron and shoot horses. Now, speculating back on it, I think the worst thing I ever seen in his life was not my sister's dropping dead in the cornfield. Nor was it the backlashing. It weren't the mother's crying at the loss of their youngest. It weren't even neck snapping of men's being hanged. Or the smell would come with it. You know what it was? Worst thing I ever seen in his life was the look of pure joy in the eyes of that crowd. as They took the lives of their fellow human beings. And all I could say is, God, help them. Wow, that that wow. Uh, that was deep, man. <laughs> I tell you what, when I wow. when I read that uh, this afternoon, man, I was uh, I was blown blown away, Ty, uh, at, at the uh, the power of, of this little short story, especially the you know the end part, because uh, you figured at some point he was going to tell you the worst thing he ever saw was the the neck snapping, but to say mm-hmm. the pure joy in the eyes of the crowd. As they took the lives of their fellow human beings, that uh, that was uh, that was powerful when I read that today. Uh, yeah. What is um? I mean, and I know you have a book, uh, Breath of My Ancestors. Now, in the book, are there similar stories like this, or was it more? Yeah, pre- in this particular book, I have ten stories that uh, you know, all of them are not as uh, as uh, as dark as that one. Uh, matter of fact, I have a story in here about a guy by the name of Amos Sweeney who. Hung who hung around with Lewis Latimer. And he tells the story of how it wasn't Thomas Edison, but it was Lewis Latimer who came up with the electric light. And he tells his story from, from the, in the vernacular of a person that would live in that time, who was like around 18 and 70. And, um, and I have a few others. Like I got another story in there about 
uh, an actual event. What I do is I take poetic license and create characters, but I use actual events. Well, just like all fiction, man, most fiction is believable because uh, you put historic events and weave them into it, and that's what makes it believable. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a story in there about a guy, about a, in, what, in the book, Breath of My Ancestors, Reflections from the Conscience of an African American, that's the title of the book. I have one story in there about a guy by the name of Paco Suarez Hope, who, um, a lot of people are not aware of this, but in June of 1860, I'll tell you what you can do and your listeners can do. Google Texas Troubles. Google Texas Troubles, brother, and see what, do you know that in 1860, a small band of black men got together and burnt down four cities, big cities in Texas, including Dallas burnt it to the ground, and you don't even see it in the history books. Texas don't even see it in the history books. Anyway, so I wrote this story about a guy who, who actually would help facilitate that because they, he, he had been branded. They branded him. In, in, okay, a little, little, little history, a little historical fact. In 1825, when uh, Texas was annexed, and they rumbled with the, you know, the Alamo, and you've heard all them stories about how Texas became Texas, and they took it from the, you know, the, from the, from Mexico and Santa Ana and that battle and everything. Well, in 1830, there was a mandate that any white man who brought a black slave to Texas received 80 acres of land free and clear. Wow. Did you hear what I said? 80 yeah, acres yeah. of land free and clear. 80 acres of land free and clear for bringing one slave. And you, all you got to is right in, 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 in the Austin legislature. You can go read it. Oh, no, you ain't got to do that. Just Google Texas Troubles. Now, what happened to me one night, I just woke up in the middle of the night and had Texas Troubles in my head. I don't even know where it came from. Mm. Um, I, I Googled it, and I was, I, couldn't, I was blown away. So there's a story in there about that. And mostly, it, well, I got some essay observations about drugs, my political views, because I'm, I'm, I'm probably a lot. I don't think we're going to disagree much because I it's a bust at Barack Obama. I'm I'm actually mad with the brother about, you know, because mm -hmm. it's a bust that I believe he could have could been done and has not done. So politically, uh, that's another thing. But I got all the, I got I have those kind of issues inside the book, okay, as well as a, a lot of poetry. So all right, well uh, you know we're winding we're winding down here, uh, Ty. I, I tell you I have been. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to you talk uh, this evening, so I appreciate you again for coming on. Um, I want to make sure, though, uh, before we get out of here, you have an opportunity to uh, to plug how people can get in contact with you. I know you did it once, but go ahead and do it one more time for me. Well, um, tygrayl.com is, is and that's T-Y-G-R-A-Y with a dash, E-L.com is the website. Um, you can find me on Facebook, tygrayl. My book is also, you can like my book, Breath of My Ancestors, that's on Facebook. I'm also at, um, at Ty Grail on Twitter. And I, I do a lot, of, I speak at a lot of churches, um, a lot of colleges, community events, uh, whatnot. And you can actually uh, book me by calling 301-310-5500. Three five. That is the office of Gray L Entertainment Media Syndicate, uh, and we uh, we we're, we're in the business of uplifting uh, humanity, uh, specifically dealing with our people, uh, in particular, and the world at large. Uh, but I believe that we if we if we raise ourselves up, we can help raise other people up. We got to stop killing each other and shooting each other. Right. And and that that's you know, that's the uh, that's the that's what we gotta get to. Man. That's that's the key. I, I agree. I think I think one of the do things that we don't do um often enough, um, as black people especially, um, is just that work with each other, uh, to, to bring, you know, us up as a as a whole as opposed to bringing us up individually. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I've talked to on several occasions how I think we're, we're we're lacking in the entertainment industry because because of not working together uh, consistently enough and, and sort of uh, I always call it always chasing 
uh, that deal from the from the, from one of the big guys as opposed to just working with each other and bringing each other up slowly. You know, you, you don't you won't come up as quickly because sometimes the money isn't there. But if you work hard at this thing, uh, you'll get there, and uh, and eventually you can compete with the big guys. You know. And, and just that working together, even when it comes to our commerce, you know, we, we spend over a trillion dollars a year and, and most of that money um, is not is not hitting the black community. It's, it's hitting somewhere outside of the black community. Um, so so we have that power uh, to bring ourselves up, as you say. But what we have to do a better job of bringing that money to us um, and helping each other come up as opposed to just letting it lead the community and then and then hoping at some point it'll trickle back down uh, due to whatever policies or however you expect it to trickle back down. But, but that certainly has been proven not to happen. So we're going to have to make it happen if we want to, uh, to rise up, if you will. Well, let me just say this. I applaud what you guys are doing, the Real Family Talk, because that, that's the way, that's the only way we get educated. We, matter of fact, We've gotten away from the oral tradition that brought us here. So you, you have to talk, and and, and it is through oral tradition that that you know, we that's where, that's where we really are accustomed to learning because it was handed down. It was handed down. You know what I mean? And and so I applaud what you guys, you know, the efforts that you guys are making, and uh, I appreciate you allowing me to come on your show. Um, I will be doing some things in Florida. Um, Real soon. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be in, in uh, over in um, Pensacola at the Estevanico Festival, and I think that's May. I mean, I'm sorry, no, April the 20th. And I know that's a little ways from you guys, but I'm going to be doing other things in Florida. I'm doing some stuff with Dr. Uh, Evelyn Bethune. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, Dr. Bethune. It was over at Bethune Cookman. Cookman, yeah. The grand, the granddaughter of of, of Dr. Uh, of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be doing some stuff, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back in touch with you guys. So Definitely. You and, if, wanna... and if you're in the city, you make sure you uh, you give us a call. And if it's Tuesday night, we'll definitely uh, bring you by. Yeah. Uh, we're winding down thank here, you. so I just want to thank you again for joining us, uh, Ty, and uh, I hope you have, a, you have a good evening now. You too, and I appreciate you guys. Thank you for thank having you me so on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And check out the book, you all. It, it's very comprehensive. Most... Um, writings you don't see them as 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 comprehensive as this this is 250 pages of poems and stories so you usually just see little small books um of of works like this so definitely check that out breath of my ancestors reflections from the conscious of an a, um an african Amer- african i'm sorry in america uh so again we uh, we want to thank ty gray uh uh, for joining us. Uh, definitely interesting conversation. We'll see you next week, same time, 9 p.m. Real Family Talk. Find us on Facebook. Find us on Twitter. Um, and uh, check out the website, realfamilytalk.weebly.com. This is Jay Real signing off. Until Facebook, next week. Real Family Talk. You can follow us on Twitter, Real Family Talk. The website, realfamilytalk.weebly.com. WOKB Winter Garden Orlando.